Hi, I'm Tina Mead, a librarian here at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library in downtown Chicago. Behind me is our exhibit, The Allied Race to Victory, the air, land, and sea campaigns that ended World War II. We are gonna delve into the Pacific Theater island hopping campaigns, which were integral to the eventual Allied victory, but are often overshadowed by the actions in Europe. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's go. The Bunker Hill is a wonderful fighting ship. We are all proud of her. Her record was built from blood and courage. We can't forget those men who died so we could be proud of her. Follows the story of my stay aboard a ship in the US Navy as a gunner. My part was small. I'm only one of many. It is impossible to write down emotional feelings that I've experienced under fire. My nerves have been keyed up for the entire 10 months to the highest possible pitch. And it is a difficult task to relax completely even now when I know I am comparatively safe. We all know we are on a lucky ship. The question we keep to ourselves is, how long can we stretch our luck? Following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and America's entry into World War II, American efforts in the Pacific were focused on repelling Japanese forces from further expansion in the region. Through major naval engagements with the Imperial Japanese Navy at Coral Sea and Midway, the United States Navy halted the Japanese advance in the South Pacific while inflicting severe losses on the Japanese fleet. By 1944, Allied forces had made significant progress in pushing the Japanese out of the South Pacific, and with continued Allied success in Europe, American leaders began shifting resources towards the war in the Pacific. Although this was an Allied effort with Australian, British, Filipino, and others, the vast majority of the fleet and fighting forces were American. Offensive operations proceeded on a two-prong approach, with forces under General Douglas MacArthur in the Southwest Pacific preparing to retake the Philippines, while forces under Admiral Chester Nimitz began an island hopping campaign in the Central Pacific. We will be following this path, covering the campaigns to take the Marianas and Iwo Jima, but there were many other islands captured by the Allies on their path to defeating the Japanese military. The first major campaign for U.S. forces in 1944 was to capture the Mariana Islands of Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. The islands would be essential to gain airfields from which the American Air Forces could strike mainland Japan. We call this an island hopping campaign because that's exactly what it was. Each island needed to be taken individually. The taking of one allowed the U.S. forces to regroup and then take the next. The leadership had to adjust their plans for each assault based on the unique features of each island's coastline. To make the situation more complicated, the Japanese had been occupying and fortifying some of these islands since the 1930s. This put U.S. forces at a major disadvantage. To balance the fight, the Americans came with a very large fleet, 274 strong, providing support for the invading allies from both air and sea, often bombarding the Japanese for hours or days before the U.S. forces came ashore. In Saipan, of course, we were on a trip ship, but we came off of the ropes on the side, you know, where they throw the ropes over the side, and they came off of the ropes into the Higgins boats, where they just jumped the front end of it, you know. And uh, we came off there and, and headed for the Saipan, and we went in, and of course, that there, that was the first time we were, you know, almost under fire. And what I can remember, I knew this one guy from, he was from the Bronx. He was a good friend of mine. And as we went in, they were dropping some orders on us. And I, we never had had that before. I, we didn't know, we had experience with that. So we just tried to, we couldn't dig in. You just hit the ground, you know, and, and they could go anywhere. So you just had to move in. And I remember as I went by, he was laying there, he had a, his arm blown away. But they had given us, a, everybody had a little shot of that morphine on them, you know, that we carried. And then, and he told me, so I went by, he said, Marty, give me a hand. He said, I'm here. I said, so I took out my little morphine that I had, and I gave him a little shot of it, and I told him, I said, I, I said, they'll come pick you. I said, they'll come and be here. And I moved on. For the Marines landing on Saipan, Japan's years of preparation meant devastation. Carefully placed barbed wire obstacles created bottlenecks, 
while flags meticulously set into the ground indicated distance for more accurate indirect fire. Just a few miles inland, the Japanese used their intimate knowledge of the volcanic terrain and cave systems of the island to their advantage. The Marines were forced to advance under intense enemy fire, clearing defensive positions with grenades and flamethrowers at close range. Though the Japanese were unsuccessful in their efforts to halt the American advance, they did inflict a high number of casualties on the U.S. forces over the course of the month-long battle. Meanwhile, in the nearby Philippine Sea, the Japanese reacted to the attack on Saipan by sending nearly their entire carrier-based fleet, hoping to draw the Allies away from supporting the invasion. A shout went up, and we looked over at the Wasp. A Jap dive bomber snuck in under a low cloud cover and made a leisurely gliding dive on her. Realizing there might be others around, we looked upward. There were two Jap dive bombers diving on us. We immediately trained our guns and cut loose. The five inches missed, the 40 millimeters missed. The 20 millimeters peppered away and the first plane broke into flames. We shifted targets and held the triggers down. The second plane suddenly broke in two and the forward section just missed our starboard bow by about 50 feet. We were cheering wildly. We looked around for casualties. Corporal Littlewood was dragging himself to the clipping room, trying to get out of the way. He was hit by shrapnel in his left side under the lung. When he was hit, he was standing about six feet from me. In back of us, by the 40 millimeter director, First Lieutenant Gordon A. Stallings, second in command of the Marine Detachment, was lying in a mess of blood. He had a huge hole in his groin. He died about 15 minutes later, killed in action. The bomb landed so close to the ship that the splash completely soaked all the Marines in Battery 6. Shrapnel tore through the hangar deck. Altogether, there were two men dead and about 65 wounded. Many compartments on our port side are flooded. Repairmen worked all day, all night, and half the next day making temporary repairs. We had a full day. June 19th will go down as the United States' greatest victory over Japanese air power. While the Japanese had initiated the battle, they did not expect the speed at which U.S. forces would counterattack. With more experienced pilots and the ability to employ decisive amphibious maneuvers, U.S. Navy pilots were able to take out two of the Japanese most advanced aircraft carriers along with more than a dozen destroyers, battleships, and submarines. In their attempt to prevent U.S. forces from taking the Marianas, Japanese naval forces took heavy losses, ultimately ensuring Allied naval and air superiority for the rest of the war. With victories in the Philippine Sea and Saipan, U.S. forces moved on to fight on the next island. They didn't have far to go, it's just five nautical miles across the Saipan Channel to Tinian. Smallest of the three islands involved, Tinian was also much flatter, which enabled U.S. forces to bring ashore tanks and artillery with the help of the U.S. Navy Construction Battalion, the Seabees. Aided by this heavy firepower and the proximity to support on Saipan, the Marines were able to eliminate most resistance on the island and seize its airfields within just nine days. Although the operation to take Guam started the same day as Tinian, the fight would persist for 21 days on this the largest of the Mariana Islands. The heavy surf, reefs, and cliffs provided natural fortifications for the Japanese defenders around Guam, making for a difficult shore landing. After the strong resistance experienced on Saipan, U.S. naval commanders responded with heavier bombardment of Guam, destroying every building and palm tree that could be used to conceal the enemy. The newly formed underwater demolition teams were brought in to clear what obstacles they could and provide a path for invasion. Even with their efforts, some troop-carrying LVTs got stranded on coral reefs, dropping U.S. forces several hundred yards from shore, forcing them to wade the remaining distance. U.S. forces laboriously gained land during the day, only to face fierce Japanese counterattacks at night. If you're not going to see combat and you see all them ships, somebody's lying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, come on, man. It's like when we, when we got to Guam, they said, well, you know what? It's, this island is secure. However, in the jungle behind us is 15,000 Japanese soldiers, and they want to survive. So you're going to do suppression patrols. 15,000 Japanese is a lot of Japanese, man. You hear me? And none of them are going to surrender. None Look, of them well, are, yeah. Surrender my foot. In 
First of all, we had to fight to get up off the ground. Then we finally got some tents. The Japanese would come down at night, sneak into a tent, and cut the throat of one man to kill him. Not everybody won, so that the others could go psychologically nuts. It worked. Sure. By August 1st, the Japanese had retreated to the defendable mountainous jungle. Rain would increase the difficulty for U.S. forces, but regardless, on August 10th, organized resistance ended. And the following day, Japanese leader Lieutenant General Obata committed seppuku, ritual suicide. The Marianas were officially in Allied forces control. So why was the capture of the Mariana Islands of vital strategic importance? It enabled bombers to be positioned within range of mainland Japan. These airfields facilitated the strategic bombing campaign, which many believed was necessary to force Japan to surrender. The campaign was a costly victory, however, with American forces suffering nearly 25,000 casualties, while Japanese forces lost more than 50,000, nearly the entire garrison of the islands. The final stop on our island hopping journey is one that has become synonymous with the Pacific theater, Iwo Jima. This tiny island is the halfway point between American-held Guam and Japan, and is one of the few locations the Japanese attempted to counter the U.S. bombing campaign of the mainland. Taking Iwo Jima brought the Allies one step closer to the planned mainland invasion. Water and that black sand make the mushiest stuff you ever saw. I mean, you jump off into the sand and you're in a foot deep of mushy sand. It's the darn stuff, it's great big chunks. Anyway, I go back to the beach and here's these guys still laying there. And I look around, they're all dead. I mean, every 10 foot in any direction. And there's people and, and they, You know, when you talk about dead people, you think about body parts and all that flying all over the place. That's not a lot of the way that a lot of people died. They were just laying there. Just a bunch of wrecked stuff scattered on the beach. You couldn't hardly get through all the stuff. Things blowing up and buried into the sand and uh, lots of bodies. Yes, uh, they couldn't evacuate them because they couldn't get the boats in to uh, take them off. So there were lots of uh, lots of dead Marines around. And uh, finally we got to the first airfield. And to me, that was the most deadly place on the island. Because to run across that airfield with no protection, nothing to jump behind or hide in or anything of that nature, with no bushes or or anything. You might find a shell crater occasionally that you could jump in and get some protection. But to run across that airfield was very deadly. So we lost an awful lot of Marines. Once we got across the airfield, that's when we ran into the pillboxes. They were self-protecting kind of pillboxes. That if you approached one, the other two, they were built in pods of three, could see you approaching. So they were self-protecting. And we had tried to break through those things most of the day. And we, we had lost a tremendous number of Marines. So he was very frustrated. And we were sitting in this big hole. And he looked over at me and said something to the effect, uh, do you think you could knock it out any of those things with a flamethrower? I have no idea what I said. None. Some of the men in the hole said that I said, I'll try. So uh, he, he assigned some Marines with me, to, four Marines, to give me some protection. And two of them had automatic uh, weapons. And the other two were just rifle uh, uh, people and one rifle people. So I went to where we keep our uh, flamethrowers. And I got one of those, and then I selected these for these four guys went with me, and I positioned them in a position where, approaching the first pillbox, they could fire in the aperture of these pillboxes to try to keep the Japanese from being able to fire at me. And uh, so 
I began crawling out through the sand dunes. Uh, and I didn't run, I didn't jump up and run, charge anything. I just crawled as far as I could crawl, mm -hmm. get close enough that I could fire, rolling the flame into the pillboxes. Mm -hmm. Much of that day, I do not remember. And I am positive it was fear that took that memory away. Mm -hmm. On February 19, 1945, Marines landed on the island, beginning what was one of the bloodiest battles in the War of the Pacific. Anticipating the American invasion, Japanese soldiers created over 11 miles of underground tunnels, bunkers, and pillboxes on the island, protecting them from the heavy U.S. air and naval barrages, which lasted over three weeks. The Japanese forces waited until the Marines were completely exposed on the beaches before attacking, inflicting severe casualties. During the battle, the tunnels would also enable Japanese forces to move largely undetected by the Marines. American strategy became focused on close combat, often within the tunnels themselves, as Marines sought to gain ground inch by inch. To inspire U.S. forces, a squad of Marines climbed to the summit of Mount Suribachi on February 23rd and raised the American flag, an image that would become one of the most recognizable of the war. We've only covered a few of the many islands and battles in our exhibit and made up the Pacific Theater Campaign of World War II. The combined air, land, and naval operations of the Allied forces in the final year of the war were able to strip the Japanese hold in the Pacific through the determination of American forces to counter overwhelming Japanese defenses and isolate their military from needed resources, the Allies were able to bring the war to the Japanese homeland and ultimately its end. The only way to truly measure the cost of this conflict is to look at the impact it had on those in the midst of it. We thank these brave individuals for sharing their stories with us so that we may better understand. Every experience is unique and carries wisdom. We encourage you to never stop listening and learning from the people around you.